This is The Granite Beat, a podcast where we highlight New Hampshire journalists, ask them about recent stories they've published, and about what it's like to cover their corner of this small and interesting state. I'm Julie Hart, and I'm here with Adam Jackson. Hello. Our guests today are Matt Mowry and Christine Kerrigan, who both have been associated with the title Business New Hampshire Magazine for many years. In September of last year, though, they became owners of the magazine and of Events NH. Matt is the executive editor, and Christine is chief creative officer. We asked them to join us today to talk about this transition and about investing in New Hampshire media at this time in history. Thank you for joining us, Christine and Matt. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So my first question is for Matt, uh, because I saw that you came to the magazine world from print newspapers, and specifically Foster's Daily Democrat. And um, you must have worked with Rob Doherty, who is something of a New Hampshire journalism icon. Oh, yes. A legend. I wonder if you have a good Rod story that you'd like to share. (laughs) Yeah. You know, Rod, I learned so much from him and, you know, he has helped to shape so many uh, journalists that are working in the state now. And, uh, you know, Rod is an amazing editor, but uh, he was tough and uh, you never wanted to be on Rod's bad side. (laughs) And so there was, you know, Rod had instituted this rule or I shouldn't say institute rule, but reminded everyone that, you know, we are responsible for making sure we are giving the most accurate information and our our correction rate had been beyond his liking of late. And so he said, that's it. He goes, the next correction that comes in, you're coming into my office and you're going to be explaining yourself. And I had not had to have a correction up until that point. And then I had a story. It wasn't a, a huge correction, but I had a mistake that comes story. So I was the very first person that had to face Rod under it. And I'm shaking in my shoes. And, you know, it was called the fishbowl is office because it's all windows and it faces the newsroom. So you do the walk of shame into Rod's office and I'm get, just getting ready to get lambasted. And I sit down and he looks at me and goes, Matt, really? You're my first one. <laughs> and, so we had a discussion, but it was not as bad as I, I was anticipating to be because, you know, my, my, my record had <laughs> saved my bacon a bit. But I also respect it, though, that, you know, Rod reinforced that we are an important source of information for our community. And if we don't get it right, our community loses trust in us. You know, that's the only thing that we have to trade on is our integrity and our reputation and our ability to correctly report what's going on. So uh, even though it was a semi-traumatic experience, (laughs) it just emphasized, I think, to all of us, like, yeah, you know, we we have a responsibility here. And even though, you know, in the daily grind, it can get tough when you're dealing with complex issues and being a human being, sometimes things happen and, and you miss something, you know, or you get a fact wrong and you realize, yeah, you can't afford to do that. Gotta be on top of my game all the time. So with that being said, I'm interested to know how the two of you think about Granite Media Group. Is this a, do you see yourself as being in the print media business, as being in the, as part of the journalism industry, uh, or is it something else? How do you see this company uh, and the two titles, Events NH and Business NH Magazine, as, uh, what is their role? Well, I think our vision with the new company, Granite Media Group, is we certainly intend to keep the print publication business, New Hampshire Magazine, because we think that's really valuable to our readership. We see ourselves as a multimedia company, so we want to be able to bring information to our readers in whatever form they consume it, basically. So whether that's you know a print publication, uh, we also have a digital newsletter that we send out weekly. We've got the podcast, which is also weekly, and that's where Matt and our other partner, Nathan, interview different business leaders from around the state and learn about their entrepreneurial journey. And we feel that our events division as well plays into that, where we have a number of business events that we do throughout the year that celebrates different businesses that we may have featured and highlighted in the magazine. And then we have our other side of our events. We have two consumer events that we do, which are shopping expos, basically. And, you know, sometimes people won't quite understand how that fits in with the mission of a business publication. But our goal is always to, we say, elevate and celebrate businesses. So by having the expos, we're really trying to give uh, exposure to those small micro nano businesses that are in the state 
and um, give them the exposure they need to help grow their companies to the level that they're looking for. So that's kind of how it all works together. And we're part of that trend. You know, I come from a print background. That was, you know, what I went to school for, for journalism. It was, you know, I wanted to be a community-based reporter. My first jobs were with the Caledonian Record newspaper over in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, and then Foster's Daily Democrat for five years. And so, and then the magazine, but like all print media, you know, we can't just identify ourselves as print media anymore. We are all becoming multimedia companies. We are meeting our readers uh, where they are. And that means, you know, whether that's online and podcasts, you just aren't strictly a print media product. But I will say our magazine, that print media product, is at the heart of everything we do. That is what we are known for. And we are very much part of the journalism community. All the ethos and um, that I learned in newspapers drives our magazine. You know, we are here to be a reliable source of information for our community of readers, which is the statewide business community. And we take that very seriously. Do you have a breakdown as to, you mentioned meeting those readers where they are, however they want to consume it. Do you have a breakdown as to what your print circulation is like versus your web traffic versus that weekly newsletter? Yes. So we're about 10, 11,000 print readers currently. And in the last few years, we saw an amazing switch where, you know, our print audience was larger than our online audience. That has now flip-flopped. And so now we're about 30,000 online uh, unique visitors a month, I believe. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. And then, uh, Christine, can you talk about our e-newsletter audience? Our e-newsletter audience, absolutely. We have about 16,000 individuals that that goes out to weekly. So it's another way for us to reach people that maybe they don't want the print publication, but they do still want to get some of the information. We've noticed that, yeah, that that list is growing quite extensively, which is great because it gives us a way to target readers and, and send them the information that they need. Well, that's that's really interesting. So each of your web traffic readers, your newsletter readers, each of those are, is a larger group than the print reader. Yes. And so we are finding where, yes, we have crossover in those audiences. But we're also finding um, each of those products reaches unique audiences for us as well. So do they all get the same content? No, they don't. So there is some content that is unique just to the, our print audience because that is still our chief revenue driver of the company. And so we never want to cannibalize that product. So there's some information that you're only going to find if you're a print subscriber. There is some content that is online only. And so in the e-newsletter crosses both of those audiences. But there is, you know, there is some content that is shared across all the channels. Do you see a day where you no longer print? I don't right now. <laughs> no. N not right now, no. Um, you know, we are toying with, you know, or I shouldn't say toying, but looking into, you know, what other publications done, which is to bring our print product in into an electronic format. But we're doing that carefully because, as I said, that's our premier product. And so we want to make sure that we're doing it in such a way that serves our readers uh, and, and our advertisers. What do you see as the greatest risks and opportunities for this newly formed business, Granite Media Group? There's a lot on both. Yes. <laughs> what we like to say is that we are a startup with a legacy product. So, you know, I've been with the company for 22 years. It's almost four years old. Christine, how long have you been with it? 16 years. So, you know, there's a longevity both on staff, a long history of the magazine. We have a very active readership, which I have enjoyed. But, you know, we are a startup. We bought the company. We are started ground zero. So we've been instituting new technology to make us more efficient. You know, we're doing outreach to our advertisers, both old, new and potential to, you know, make sure we're meeting their needs. And most importantly, we're making sure that there was no disruption in both the quality of the magazine and in its operations so that the transition was seamless for our readers. There is a lot of opportunity, I think, under the new leadership, mainly because our previous publisher, Heidi Copeland, did a phenomenal job of leading us, of growing us, getting us through the pandemic, which everyone in media knows was not an easy task, particularly for print. And so in handing over the reins to us, three of us, we realized just how much, I mean, I respected my boss, 
I did not realize how much that job entailed until we divvied up between the three of us and went, how did she do this? We frequently find ourselves saying, I can't believe that one person did this. Because with the three of us, you know, taking over the helm, we're like, how in the world did she sustain this company on her own, basically, you know, and, and do all these things. I have my, yeah, my respect and admiration has gone up like, you know, tenfold for what she, especially getting us through the pandemic. I mean, that was just a tough, tough time. And as I'm sure Matt's going to talk about soon, but so for a long while, we were sort of in sustaining mode, just trying to make sure that we can get through and keep it going. And something we're really looking forward to with Granite Media Group is to now get back into growth mode and see where we can, you know, for all intents and purposes, made it through the pandemic. And, you know, we're trying to see where we can now take the company into the future and, and really get back into that growth mode mindset. So what do you see as your opportunities for growth? Certainly taking a look at growing our events division, growing our offerings as a media company. So taking a look, are there different avenues, whether it's bringing on new publications, new podcasts, other new media outlets that can help us to grow our audience and grow revenue opportunities while still obviously keeping to the mission, which is first and foremost, making sure we're informing readers in the way that they need information. That's always going to be the driver of the company. It's just what are the different avenues that we can do that that best meet their needs. And being three owners, I think that's where that also presents a lot of growth opportunity in that one person can only do so much. With three of us, we're able to really create our own lanes to be in and to work together to grow the company. And so, you know, for me, it's freeing up some of that time to really be strategic in how do we produce new editorial products that help our readers. With Christine, she's really able to focus in on the event side of things. And again, what can we do that ties into what we're doing and from an editorial standpoint that we can bring and add an extra element for our readers to come together to hear experts in person to be able to ask questions of them of their own as well so you know we're looking at opportunities to grow that and then with Nathan Carroll on board who was the former executive of the Littleton Chamber and then he has his own business consultancy he's really able to focus on operations which takes that off our plates so that we can focus on what's important to readers while Nathan is making sure we're on track to be financially stable, secure, and taking care of those day-to-day -day operations so that it's not swamped under one person. It's spread across the three of us. And having him come in in that role, sort of being an outsider, as it were, to the publishing industry, it gave us fresh perspective too. So Matt and I have been with the company for a long time. We've kind of, you know, sometimes you fall into the, we're going to do things this way because that's how they've been done. It's been great to have Nathan come in as somebody not necessarily so familiar with the publishing industry, but very familiar with the business industry and how to help grow businesses and come up with strategic plans and get his outside perspective and really help get Matt and I to go, oh yeah, well that, that does make sense to look at this a new way. So I think that's definitely Nathan's strengths as one of the owners of the company. I'd like to step back a little bit and could, could you bring us back to how and when you all learned that this company might be available for a, a transfer? and why, how this conversation started about, hey, do you think that we should buy it? I think that's sort of like, uh, how do you get from being employees to now owner, co-owners? Yeah, it's a, a very roundabout story. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, both Christine and I being with the, the company as long as we have, you know, you, you get to know the rhythms of it. You know, Heidi was the third publisher I've worked for here, and she was fantastic. But, you know, we saw what Heidi had gone through, you know, making sure we got through the pandemic and other personal things that had come up for her in her life that were a, a lot. And we take it all into consideration, you know, and she was towards retirement age. And so, you know, you just naturally go at some point, she's going to need to sell this. And so, you know, Christina and I have worked together a long time and we've had these conversations as long time employees going, so what do you think she's going to do? Like theoretical conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And so, but it, you know, it's one of those intellectual exercises that you do and, and, you know, conversations you have between friends. But I think we were both at a point in our careers, too. We'd been with the magazine for a while. And you start to go, you know, as much as I love the publication, you know, is there a next step? You know, with me, I was getting into my 50s. You know, what does that look like if I'm ever going to take a next step? Now's the time before I become completely into age discrimination category. And I think, Christine, you were kind of in that. 
I was. I had sort of reached that point where being with the company for 15, 16 years, I just needed a change. It was time for something new. I'd been, you know, designing the magazine for, you know, a good chunk of that time. I've had different roles within the organization, but probably for at least a good 12 years or so, I had been designing the magazine. And I just needed a change, whether it was within the company, you know, having different responsibilities within the company or sadly leaving the company and finding a new position because I was starting to feel like there wasn't another step up in the company. So that's why Matt and I were kind of having those discussions. I don't think, and I won't speak for you, Matt, but I might a little bit here. I don't think either of us actually wanted to leave the company because we we love the product. We love the people we work with. We really believe in it, but you also have to look at your own, your own career and say, yeah, I need, I, I need a change. So that's where we both ended up. On the other end, Heidi was, you know, putting feelers out because she was, you know, ready to retire from the magazine. And, you know, I think had a a couple deals that didn't go through, we came to find out later because it is a tough market. And then Nathan had actually come on board. He had approached us about starting a podcast together, which is something we wanted to do. And so we worked together and did that. And through that, Heidi approached him to say, hey, you know, I'm thinking of selling the magazine. Would you be interested? And Nathan had never thought about getting into the publishing industry, but he started thinking about it and he really liked the publication and had worked with us and gotten to know us. And he came back and said, you know, I'm interested because I've never worked in publishing. I won't do it unless Matt's on board. So Heidi, you know, had to take a gamble at that point of coming to me because if I said no, and then I know that she's selling, she's taking a risk that her longtime editor's going to start, you know, going out the door. So she approached me, let me know what was going on and said, what do you think? She goes, I would love to know that I'm passing this along to you. And so, you know, all of a sudden, all these theoretical discussions we had became very, very real. And I went, you know, I know it's a tough field. I know there's a tough road ahead, but, you know, people have been ringing the death knell for print for my entire career. And, you know, there's always a need for great journalism, no matter what form it takes. And I really believe in this product and I love my job and I love our audience. And I love having a statewide audience of the leadership of this state that are reading us and wanting to be informed by us. And I said, you know, I'm not going to find that anywhere else. And to have the continued to having the editorial freedom I had under Heidi and then having that and then plus... I just decided, you know, I'm never going to have this opportunity again in my life. And it's time to put my money where my mouth is about my love of of journalism and print. And, you know, am I the next one to shepherd this through? And then I went, but I'm not going to do it without Christine because of the talent she brings. And so I said, Nathan, what do you think about a third partner? And he he had met Christine and said, you know what? That's pretty brilliant because we each bring different skill sets to the table. So then I approached Christine and we went forward from there. So. I was just curious, when were these conversations actually taking place? So Matt, you and Nathan had talked towards the end of, I want to say 2021. Yes. In that range. And then Matt and I had just sort of tentatively been talking, you know, just talking as you do as coworkers. But it was around the holidays of 2021 where Matt and I were chatting again. He already knew about Heidi's plan. And so he just said to me, he's like, let's talk again after the holidays because he was under an NDA. So he couldn't talk to me about anything official that was happening, you know, he had to get permission from Heidi and from Nathan and, you know, all that. So then once that all sort of came together, it was about February or March of last year. So about a year ago now that we had decided the three of us were in, we had to sign NDAs (laughs) for everything. And that to me, signing the NDA made it really official. (laughs) That was the, okay, because you have to do your due diligence and get financials from the previous company and things like that. So that's what, that's what made it real. And I think what made me want to to get involved as well is I, I think I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit in the back of my head too. Like I thought about, you know, having my own business. I do have my own small kind of side craft business. So I've kind of had my own, my foot in the entrepreneurial world in that. And I've always thought that I wanted to, to do that and kind of be my own boss as it were. So this opportunity came and it, it felt definitely like the right thing. And, and then we dove right in. Well, you, you can only write about other small business startups for so long before it starts to sound pretty good, right? Right. right. There are times that you're you're interviewing someone. I've met some great leaders, and there's other folks you're interviewing. And you're like, if they can do it, <laughs> <laughs> I will not name any name. <laughs> do uh, so. So, how does it feel now to go from being uh, employees to owners? Mind blowing, overwhelming. So many adjectives that could go with that. 
but it's exciting. exciting. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, we have a love of this magazine. We've had ownership of it for a while. You don't do our jobs and lead the creative side and the editorial side for that many years without having investment in it. So it's exciting to know that, okay, we're going to take it to the next steps. And all these ideas of that you have of, if only I were in charge, well, now you are. So, you know, it's time to, to put up or shut up. And so, it, but, you know, there was a lot that went into it, even just before buying it, we had to sit down as a group and talk about not just the nuts and bolts of putting the deal together, but, okay, so here's my philosophy on journalism and what I believe needs to be done. And these are the lines in the sand that we shall never cross. You know, we're never going to set, we've never sold our edit, editorial. We're never going to advertising and edit. The wall will remain there. And ab about what kind of workplace we wanted this to be. Heidi did create a great work environment for us. And so it was making sure we were all on the same page as to what was going to continue, what we're going to improve on, you know, what kind of employer we wanted to be on top of what kind of publication we wanted to be. So there were all those discussions. And now, you know, once you take over, then you're all of a sudden in, you know, you've been in the, the, the waiting period of trying to buy it. And then it's all rushing into you. And you're seeing no matter how much due diligence you do and how long you've worked in the business, there's always something you didn't know. And so, you know, we had a lot of systems we had to put in place to make us more efficient that just hadn't been in place for a while. And so that consumed us. And in the meantime, when you're taking all this on, you're still juggling like, oh, I'm still the editor. I still got to get a publication out each month. Christine's got to design it. It's like our jobs didn't go away. They just got compounded. And then you feel the weight of it more, you know, like, okay, this publication that's been around for decades, it's my responsibility now. All these people that were colleagues of mine, they're my responsibility now. And, and you feel the weight of that. And you have the 3 a.m. panic attack. <laughs> about what did I do? Am I the right person for this? And you calm down, you realize you've been doing this and, and you know, we can do this. And I've got two great partners to rely on and a terrific staff. Well, that leads into one of my questions, which is this title has been around for 40 years. Why do you think it has survived for so long? And then second part, how do you keep it continuing to survive for another 40 so by all rights, and this is, I have said my entire career there, we had no right to survive, right? We're a monthly print publication in an up-to-the-minute news world. It's an interesting challenge to put that together because I'm planning stories out two months in advance that need to be timely in two months and beyond because of the shelf life we have that need to be relevant at the same time. And so I think that's part of it is that we as a staff have really been dedicated to that mission. Like we are never going to break the news, but what we do, we do really well, which is analyze what is going on and break it down for our readers. And it's survived because we have evolved with the times. We've kept adding on to our offerings, but without ever cannibalizing that core product, that the magazine, which is the heart of everything we do. And we have a reputation for being principled, for being accurate. We are one of the few publications that back check with sources because we are monthly. I can't correct things on a dime. We got to get it right the first time. We have a very low correction rate. And so in that part of that is that we take the time and other publications probably just don't have the time when you're doing not just a daily, but an hourly publication to be able to call sources and say, hey, this is what the information we attribute to you. Is this correct? which is also an interesting dance to do when they want to, you know, change things that just because they didn't sound right and you have to go, no, no, that's not what we're doing. <laughs> you know, the fact that we're able to do long form in-depth journalism is what's really kept us surviving this long. And I think it's because we take a look at being a business magazine from a, a different viewpoint. We're here to service the business community, but the stories we do, there's nothing that's off limits. There's times that we've been told, why don't you stay in your lane? Well, we don't have a lane. It's just that we take a look at issues from an economic standpoint. So yes, we're going to cover businesses and we're going to cover the economy, but we're also going to cover how issues of race in New Hampshire affect the state from an economic viewpoint. We're going to take a look at homelessness in New Hampshire from an economic viewpoint. And so because we're willing to take on stories that may not people think of traditional business stories and do it in a way that services our business community, informs them of their role in the, that issue and how that issue affects them or their workforce, I think that's kept us with a, a very loyal readership that we've also been able to build on as the business community churns. Businesses come in, businesses go out, and we have to make sure that we're reaching all those audiences. 
anything coming up on your production plan that you'd like to preview? Uh, yeah. So I'm excited that the next couple of issues. So we just are put our February issues just about to come out, which has a lot of great topics into it, into it. But in March and April, we have really dedicated to getting back into putting together packages of stories that really dive deep into topics. And so our March issue, we're taking a look at diversity inclusion training that is going on in New Hampshire and taking a look at, you know, why is it important and in this very politicized atmosphere, how do you go about doing DEI training that is effective and why businesses need to be doing this, why they are doing it. And the fact that this is a, a market that's billions of dollars and will be growing at an exponential rate over the years. So we're taking a deep dive look into that and who's doing it in the state and, and what what is effective. Our April issue, we're, our new staff writer is taking a deep dive into homelessness from an economic standpoint. So we have a whole suite of stories that's going to take a look at all of the economic issues that affect this issue from the debate over are we funding enough or not enough this issue and is it being spent effectively based on, you know, the city's mayors pointing fingers at the state saying you're not spending enough in this area and supporting it and the governor pushing back saying you got money and you didn't spend it effectively. So what is the truth in that? Where does that lie? Taking a look at when you are, when someone is homeless and seeking to get a job, what are the barriers to that? What is it like to have to, to job search when you don't have a home to go to at the end of the day, your own bathroom to get ready in for a job interview, maybe not the clothes that you would want to go in, you know, what does that look like for people? And those are just some of the stories we're, we're looking at in, in that uh, package. So that's some of the things that we have coming up. Oh, sounds like a great, great addition. Do you have any questions, Julie? I do. I have a question for both of you, Matt and Christine. What advice would you give somebody who's interested in starting a career in journalism or publishing? Don't do it. No. <laughs> That's our most common answer. <laughs> that is the wrong answer. No, um, I would urge people to go into this because I'm very passionate about what we do and the important role that we play in our communities. And and that's just it. Make sure you're passionate about it. You're not going to make a lot of money doing this. I mean, I own a publication and trust me, I'm not making a lot of money. <laughs> you know, you, you don't do it to, you can make a comfortable living, but the reason that you do it is because you know that there are stories that need to be told out there, that you're dedicated to the communities that you're covering and making sure that you are the watchdog for your community to make sure that you're telling the stories of the great things people are doing in your community, but making sure you're there to under, you know, communicate what's going wrong in your community and what are the solutions to it and bringing, shining a light on things that need the light on them so that you can be the impetus for discussions. You know, we're not there to force uh, an opinion on people or to say, this is the answer. We're there to share, this is the, what's going on in your community. This is what people are doing about it in your community. This is why it's important. And then you give them the information so that they can go forward and make the decisions in their lives and their communities that are important. You play an important role in that. And community journalism is disappearing at an alarming rate. I just look at our state house and, you know, the number of reporters that used to be in it. And there's so many stories to be told out of every legislative session and there's so many fewer people to tell it. And that's, that's a dangerous thing for our state. And so I would say... Go into journalism because we need you in there. Your communities need you in there. But make sure you're going in for the right reasons that you're passionate about and that you're dedicated to getting it right. You're not there to voice an opinion, not there to be a blogger. You're there to be a professional journalist who is there to gather the facts and get it out to the community. Well said. Christine, do you have a response? I have nothing to add. I think Matt hit the nail on the head. <laughs> do you still hear Rod Doherty in your ear when you're fact-checking? All the time. And, it, <laughs> and he, I say this in a good way, he drives my guilt, right? Because Rod, I was there in the, among Foster's heyday. I was, you know, there from 1995 to 2000 when we had 10 offices. I started in the Summersworth office before becoming the Tri-City editor over at Dover. And there I had, you know, 10 reporters that reported to me that we were signing out to. If it happened in your community and you were covering it, you were in trouble. And, you know, I have a whole state to cover in every industry in it. And it's myself and Scott Merrill, a terrific a staff writer and a host of terrific freelance writers. And I have 12 issues to do it in each year. 
and there's just no way to get to everything. And I hear Rod going, but why, what, this is happening. Why isn't it in the publication? It's, it's that driver, you know, you, you, you want to cover more than you possibly can. All right. Well, I think we're all out of questions for you, for the two of you. Is there anything else that either of you would like to say? You know, I think it's just, I've been proud of being part of the New Hampshire media community for all these years. And the fact that we get to step up and be the next wave of leadership at this publication, it's just awe-inspiring and exciting. You know, it's this opportunity to really do what we want to do with the no excuses as to why we can't do it. You know, if we don't manage to bring the publication to where we want to, shame on us, you know. But I'm, I'm proud to be part of this media landscape right now because I really do believe it's so important now more than ever that journalists are out there and covering uh, what we can, and we're seeing it change. We're part of the Granite State News Collaborative, which is an uh, amazing organization. And when I started this, if you ever told me that I would be cooperating with the competition at any point, I would have thought you're crazy. You know, I was at Foster's when it was Foster's versus, you know, the Portsmouth Herald. And now Foster's is part of the Portsmouth Herald. And now, you know, I have had my byline in the New Hampshire Business Review, and I have taken on a project where I work directly with Jeff Feingold, who I have respected all these years. But, you know, Jeff is who I was competing against. And now we are doing work together and it's uh, on on the Invisible Walls Project, which is taking a look at zoning and its effects on the community and the racial undertones of zoning. And it's been one of the most rewarding projects that I've worked on. It would never have been possible without this working cooperatively. So I think we're in an exciting time of journalism. I'm, I'm glad we're part of it. Well, thank you so much for both, both of you for joining us today. It's been a really fun chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Granite Beat is a project of the Granite State News Collaborative in partnership with the Laconia Daily Sun. We record at the Lakeport Opera House, and our theme music is composed by Bob McCarthy. Thanks also to the Marlin Fitzwater Center at Franklin Pierce University for editing and other support.